As we discussed earlier, Corey, and Louis, Corey Lewandowski spent most of his time before the House Judiciary Committee stonewalling Democrats at times going on the attack as well. I think they hate this president more than they love their country. It's a tactic his former boss has used time and again undermine the investigators, like when Trump sided with Vladimir Putin over his own intelligence agencies about whether Russia interfered in the election. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. Or when he fired the FBI director who first approved the investigation. What I'm doing is a service to this country. And I did a great service to this country by firing James Comey. Comey's former special assistant at the FBI, Josh Campbell, has a different take, and he gets into it all in his new book, Crossfire Hurricane, Inside Donald Trump's War on the FBI. Josh is now a law enforcement analyst for CNN, and he joins me now. Hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we get started, I was mentioning to you off camera, the book is really well written. It's a really compelling, fluid read, so congratulations. Thank you. I that. appreciate that very much. Uh, before we get to the Russia investigation, what made you join the FBI, and then what was the catalyst for your exit? So my FBI career started in earnest uh, on September 11, 2001. I was in college, college freshman, just about a week into my college career uh, when the attacks happened on 9-11. And up to that point, I thought I was going to become a diplomat, go into the Foreign Service. The, those were my career interests. Um, but on that day, you know, we all watched the aftermath and, you know, wonder, wondering what had transpired. And then I, you know, I remember seeing these first responders, but then also these FBI agents trying to piece together what happened to bring justice essentially to a country, right? I mean, all of us were affected in some way by this. Um, and so that really changed my optic as far as how I wanted to spend the rest of my career. Uh, I, you know, I wasn't feel, feeling very diplomatic at that point. You know, I don't think many of us were. Um, and so I oriented everything about my college career from that point on to joining the FBI. I was fortunate enough to get an internship in the Bureau my junior year of college and then joined uh, right after graduation, was hired full time. Uh, had a great career d doing you know, many different things, uh, assignments domestically, around the world, um, things that I, I couldn't have even imagined. To the question about why I left, I, I really get into that in, in the book, and that is, in my opinion, you know, this was an agency that I, I still love. Um, it is so important, the mission that the men and women of the FBI have to protect the American people. And what I felt was during this, the course of the Russia investigation where you had a president who was constantly attacking and undermining the credibility of an institution, I thought that you know, that kind of manipulation of public opinion would eventually hurt the country, hurt public safety. Because if the American people believe this narrative that the FBI is corrupt or they're criminal, uh, then that's going to make us all less safe. In the book, I do mention that the FBI is not without fault. I mean, you look at the, yeah, the history like of the FBI. You look at, you know, here, obviously, in this city, the, the FBI. Um, they're not without fault. But That's a good comment to make for a Boston audience. What with the way people... It is. Yeah, no, it's true. Know, I mean, th these are human beings, and they have to constantly be held to account, you know, whenever they stray. But what I try to, to point out is this whole idea that the FBI was targeting a president or a campaign for partisan reasons is simply nonsense. You also write in the book that... People in the FBI tend to be conservative, you say, like many uh, law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. But the, the people you know, by and large, are deeply concerned about President Trump's MO. Does he also have his supporters in the Bureau? Yeah, I would say he does. I mean, it's an institution, you know, we, we constantly hear, you know, folks saying, well, you check your politics at the door. And, you know, that's true. It's, it, it's just known that in this agency that everyone has an opinion. Um, you know, again, it, I, I think it tends to skew conservative as, an, as a law enforcement institution. But it's not as though people allow their politics to actually impact their investigations and to impact their work. And so if there are people that, you know, politically support the president or, you know, politically support the president's opponent, you don't see that manifest in the day-to-day -day work, which is an important point because what the president would have you believe and his allies over the course of the last two and you know, three years and with the Mueller investigation is that these people who are inside the FBI somehow were so driven by partisan politics that they violated their oath of office and essentially broke the law in order to target and undermine him, yeah, which again, down. yeah, and, and I know that is not the case. And so that I'm trying to tell that story that, look, the FBI is not without fault, but the narrow that you're hearing is simply manipulation. Uh, you were with James Comey when he met with President Trump, President-elect Trump, I guess, mm -hmm. to tell him about the Steele dossier. You were also with him when he learned he'd been fired by the president. I'd love to get you to, to uh, tell both those stories. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time. So sure. I got to ask you, are there a couple details, one or two details from each of those 
uh, very notable moments that stand out in your memory. Absolutely. So going to the first meeting at Trump Tower, where the president-elect uh, is met by James Comey, as well as the heads of the national intelligence agencies, they were there to provide an update on the Russian interference that the U.S. intelligence community had identified. But also, Comey had a, an additional duty that day, and that was to privately tell the president about these you know, rumors that were swirling throughout Washington. And what was so interesting, one notable aspect is after that meeting, you know, on that day, he, he asked me to make a laptop available to him immediately after the meeting in the car, which was something that he had never asked. You know, we'd, we'd gone to all these different cities around the country. Um, but what he wanted to do was to start memorializing that meeting, because at the time, the FBI had four Trump campaign members under investigation. And as James Comey has said, he thought that the president might one day lie about that exchange. And so he wanted to memorialize that. We now know that these infamous uh, memos um, now became part of, you know, a recorded history. Uh, and so that part was surreal that an FBI director felt that he had to take yeah. that, that, that step. Um, and then fast forward to obviously the firing. And I, I think, and I write in the book that the, the Trump Tower meeting was the beginning of the end of Comey's career because you know, this was this would be a clash between these two individuals where you would have a president who was would eventually demand loyalty from the FBI director who wouldn't provide it. The president would ultimately ask the FBI director to drop an investigation into Michael Flynn, the national security advisor. Yeah. Comey wouldn't play ball there. And then finally, President Trump asked Comey to publicly announce that Trump was not under investigation. Comey refused. All that led to the firing. Uh, that day was surreal for a number of different reasons. I know we can't go into them all. Uh, but the first being the manner in which it happened. You know, James Comey didn't learn from the president that he'd been fired. The president didn't pick up the phone and use his infamous line, you're fired. Yeah, he doesn't like to fire people he doesn't. in person, right? Correct. No, exactly. There, there are surrogates. And in this instance, there was, you know, the president's personal bodyguard driving up to FBI headquarters and dropping off a letter at the visitor center, firing the director, not realizing it wasn't even in the same time zone. He was across the country in Los Angeles. And so I was there with Comey as he learned from CNN that he had been fired. Uh, and it really threw the bureau into this state of chaos. Uh, you know, and then obviously we know what happened after that, that. That would ultimately lead to the appointment of a special counsel. Uh, apparently I needed like an hour to ask everything I wanted. <laughs> so I think we're down to about two minutes. Yeah, so I'd yeah. ask maybe my first two or three mm -hmm. questions. As you know, better than many people, James Comey was criticized intensely for saying that the FBI had wrapped up its investigation into Hillary Clinton's email server, then reopened it. You write in the book that he erred on the side of radical transparency. Mm -hmm. He did not err on the side of radical transparency when it came to talking about the Bureau's investigation of links between Donald Trump and Russia during the campaign. I'm wondering if you're thinking on his justifications for those two different approaches has evolved from the time that you were in the FBI to your current role now as an analyst and a journalist. Uh, did, did you think he was making the right calls at the time, and do you still write? Well, it's interesting. So I actually got my job on his staff because um, of one encounter in particular where I provided him feedback that was very critical, and, and he, he wanted that. So he actually hired me to, to you know be with him and, and on his staff, um, and that set the stage. So I didn't agree with everything that he did, and I would, you know, uh, you know, say as much. Um, and even now, you know, as you mentioned now, in someone is in journalism, what I try to do is distinguish James Comey as the person. I mean, I know that he is an honorable person having worked up close, you know, with him and James Comey's actions, which are fair game for criticism. And I don't agree with all of them. You know, the language, for example, that he used in describing Hillary Clinton's behavior, which is not something that an FBI director does if you're going to, you know, then decline to prosecute. Um, so as people, you know, will read in the book, I do criticize him. Um, in certain instances about his behavior to include the leaking of his memos, right? Um, yeah. Which then led to the special counsel. I think there were other ways that that could have been handled. Yeah. All right, so what I try to do, though, is distinguish the actions from the person. So we got to skip right over Robert Mueller, mm. which bums <laughs> me out. Yeah. I want to close by asking you, as someone who was here when this all got started and has watched it unfold, do you have a... a personal informed take on what the relationship between President Trump and Russia is? The way I look at it is you have to rule things out. And I think we're running out of innocent explanations, right? If you look at each instance where the president has sided with Vladimir Putin over his own intelligence community, where you look at instances where, you know, the president says, well, you know, he was asked if Putin was a killer. He said, well, we're not so great ourselves. Instance after instance of 
doing things that just aren't in the U.S., you know, experts would argue are not in the interest of U.S. foreign policy or any type of U.S. policy. And so I don't know what the answer is. Uh, you know, we may learn eventually if there was something there. Um, but I think that we're just at this point where we're the, the actions we continue to see uh, are inexplicable and they tend to lead more toward that, that route that maybe there is some type of, you know, whether it's leverage or, you know, financial interest or whatever. Um, you know, the president obviously hasn't released his tax returns and things that could really clear this up, which, which cause a lot of questions. And I, the, you know, the last thing I would say on that is, you know, the theme of this book is that, as I mentioned, you know, these are people who are doing their job to stop a counterintelligence threat. And that was, is what was so concerning. This book takes you inside yeah. the FBI, where you have people whose mission is to protect us from the efforts of the Russians and the Chinese and foreign adversaries. And you're getting ripped by... And you're getting ripped by your own president, by your own government, which is just astounding. Unfortunately, we got to leave it there. Josh Campbell, thank you for coming in, and congrats on the book. Thank it's you really so much. Good. I appreciate it. Thank appreciate you. It. Thanks. The book, again, is Crossfire Hurricane inside Donald Trump's war on the FBI.